Our overnight accommodation was at the Craiglin Hotel in Granton on Spey. Early that morning we crossed the road to capture a view of the front of the hotel. Much of the snow from the previous day had now been cleared away from the roadway. And there was little sign of life in the village at this early hour. Some time later we were heading southwest to our tour captain's vivid description of the history of Mary Queen of Scots. The weather was dark and bleak as we traversed this snow-covered landscape and the somberness of the weather that morning seemed to reflect the life of this well-known Queen as we listened to the tale of her tragic history. Eventually we left the snow line and the bad weather and made a brief roadside stop at Blair Athol to get a view of Blair Castle in the distance, set against a backdrop of rolling hills and woodlands. The oldest part of Blair Castle, seat of the Duke of Athol, dates from 1269. In the coach once more, we left the main road near Pitlochry and travelled a short distance to the Edradour Distillery. A few minutes later, we arrived at the distillery, the smallest in Scotland, and quickly made our way to the reception area where we were to view a video on the methods of whisky making carried out on this property. We were all treated to a wee dram of the company fluid, to which we added an amount of water and still found the taste to be quite strong. Having sampled our dram and viewed the video, we were taken for a guided tour around the premises to see the various stages in the brewing process. In a corner of one room was displayed the method used to set up stills in earlier times. Oak barrels are ideal for the storage of whisky and early methods of barrel manufacture were also represented here. Items of delicate testing apparatus were displayed in a glass cabinet. And Edradour has the great distinction of brewing whisky for the House of Lords in London. As we viewed the many samples on display, our guide enlightened us on the methods of blending whisky. Blended whisky is a mixture of malt whisky and green whisky. Green whisky is made, it's a faster process and there's usually maize and wheat in with it as well. So we sell the Clan Campbell, which you'll see abroad, in duty free shop, well you don't get, we don't have duty free shops anymore now. Pot stilled or malt whisky is distilled from a fermented mash of malted barley. Patent still or grain whisky is distilled from a fermented mash of barley malt and other unmalted cereal grains. Looking down through a glass window, we were able to see the malt spread out on the malting floor to germinate under conditions of warmth and moisture. The quality of water plays an important part in the manufacture of whisky. It is only in Scotland that spring water can be found that rises through a red granite formation and passes through peat moss country to give the Scottish whisky its unique quality. Moving outside again, we were taken across to the cooling tank known as the worm. The heated whisky passes through a copper coil which is immersed in a tank of cold water for this purpose. We were then shown a variety of samples of dried barley, sugar, starch and grist, all stages reached in the brewing process. The confinement of this small building 
made it difficult to capture an overall shot of the still, even with the wide angle lens. The barley came in linen bags and a considerable supply seemed to be on hand, ready for use. Commercial distillation of whisky in Scotland dates from 1814 when excise taxes were levied and stills of less than 500 gallons were prohibited. In 1832, Aeneas Coffey obtained improvements of the column still invented by Robert Stein in 1826. This new improved version became known as the Coffey still, hence making it possible to refine lighter bodied whiskies at higher proofs. From here on, we were given a quick walk through the remainder of the distillery, taking note of the spotless cleanliness of the equipment and the highly polished finish on all the copper utensils. Completing the tour of the plant, we paid a quick visit to the shop on the premises, which afforded time for interested visitors to make a few purchases. We spent a few minutes now relaxing in the pleasant gardens of this unique distillery, the smallest in Scotland, and privileged to supply the special brew to the House of Lords in London. After a last look around the grounds of Edradour, we were back on the coach and on our way heading south to the city of Perth and on to Forfa to visit Glam's Castle. 45 minutes later we skirted around Perth on the bank of the River Tay. Perth at one time had the distinction of being the capital city of Scotland. Between the 13th and 17th centuries the city sustained several sieges finally losing its status as capital city after the murder of James I in 1437. During one time, it was occupied by the Romans for a period estimated to be 320 years. At that time, the city was called Victoria. Its present name probably derives from the Celtic Abertha at the mouth of the Tay. On arrival at Glam's Castle, we were escorted into the coach house, where many articles and photographs relating to bygone days had accumulated over several centuries were on display. A beautifully made model of the castle itself came in for a good deal of scrutiny from our tour group. The doll's house, complete with furnishings, which belonged to the Queen Mother, captured our attention. Glam's Castle was the home <coughs> of Lady Elizabeth Bowes Lyon during her early childhood. The castle is approached by a tree-lined avenue, at the end of which stand the statues of King James IV and his son, King Charles I, sculptured by Quellen and restored. The name Glams is derived from the Gaelic Glamus, meaning a wide gap or veil. The castle began as a hunting lodge in the 11th century, but underwent extensive reconstruction in the 17th century. In its present form, it is a fine example of Scottish baronial style, enriched with certain features of the pinnacled outline of a Loire chateau. 
Glam's Castle is the seat of the Earl of Strathmore and Kinghorn. Robert II bestowed the thanedom on John Lyon, who had married the King's second daughter by Elizabeth Muir and was the founder of the existing family. The main entrance to the castle is in the Angle Tower, begun shortly after 1600 by the first Earl of Kinghorn, and is flanked by a pair of lions and a small cannon. To the east of the front entrance is the Dutch Garden, laid out by the 13th Earl in 1893, but not open to the public, as this area is part of the private residence. Leaving the castle, we headed south through Dundee to St Andrews and an hour later found ourselves on the 18th green of the Royal and Ancient Golf Club of St Andrews, Scotland. A copper coloured plaque informed us that the impressive clubhouse was for members only. This club is now a shrine for golfers all over the world. The earliest records date from 1457, when golf was banned by James II on the grounds that it was interfering with his subject's archery practice. The course is situated on the edge of the beach where the film Chariots of Fire was filmed, and from our vantage point at the clubhouse, the fairways appeared to be surrounded by a number of buildings, both large and small. To one side was the old course starter box, behind which stood the caddies pavilion. We were told that Mary Queen of Scots enjoyed the game in her day and was told off for playing right after the murder of her husband Darnley. At the front of the club, the golf shop was hardly noticeable against the background of many fine buildings. Opposite the main entrance to the clubhouse was this fine rotunda which attracted our attention as we were about to head off to our next destination. About one and a half hours later we crossed the Firth of Forth. It took several minutes to cross this large expanse of water. To our left was the railway bridge which took seven years to build and was completed in 1889. The two spans of 1,700 feet were a record at the time of building. Each span consists of a 350-foot centre truss supported on 675 feet cantilever arms. We were now approaching the city of Edinburgh, capital city of Scotland, and situated on the south side of the Firth of Forth. This was to be our stopover for the night and our point of interest for sightseeing the following day.